Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on the global challenge of managing migration. My name is Taijun Tsai, Editor and Social Media Manager at the Population Reference Bureau. I'd like to know a few things before we begin with today's presentation. First, you can participate in the webinar by submitting a question for the presenter using the questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel. Type in your question and click send. So the presentation portion will run about 15 minutes and we will respond to as many questions as possible afterward. We are recording this webinar. The recording will be available soon on our website at www.prb.org. Now, I would like to introduce our presenter, Philip Martin, PRB Population Bulletin author, professor at the University of California, Davis, chair of the UC Comparative Immigration and Integration Program, and editor of Migration News and Rural Migration News. Phil, are you with us? I'm with you. Great. Let's begin. Uh Okay. Uh, well, first I want to thank PRB and all the participants. Uh, and what I want to do in my few minutes is first summarize the main points of the bulletin to make to emphasize that the share of the world's population who are international migrants is 3%, not 30%. Highlight some of the regional variations uh, between Europe and Asia and Africa and North America and, and South America and then talk a little bit about mechanisms to ensure that migrants who move are protected and that migration is mutually beneficial. And I look forward to your questions. First, a definition. Inter an international migrant, according to the United Nations, is someone who moves from one of the world's 200 countries to another for at least 12 months. That is, it doesn't matter why you move, it doesn't matter what status that you have, but the UN estimates there were about 232 million international migrants in 2013, and that's a little over 3% of the world's people. We expect international migration to go up, and the reason is that there are demographic and economic inequalities between developing and industrial countries, and we have links or bridges over the borders in communications, transportation, and rights that help people to cross borders and move. Economics works. About 60% of the world's migrants are in the 30 rich countries, but South-South migration is, going fast, is growing fast. And then finally, the message I want to leave you with is that migration is a process to, for policymakers to manage. It's not a problem, as it were, that it's going to be solved. The, basic distribution of international migrants last year was that South-South migration, say from the Philippines to Saudi Arabia, is actually slightly bigger than South-North migration, say from Mexico to the United States. But there's also a lot of migration from one so-called Northern country to another, say from Canada to the United States. And that's why we have about 60% of the world's migrants in the north or industrial countries. Now, international migration is going up faster than the global population. Well, the global population went up about 40% in the last 25 years. The stock or the number of international migrants doubled roughly in that same period. It's also important to emphasize that there is a lot more internal migration than there is international migration. There's almost four internal migrants, as from rural to urban areas in China or India or Brazil, for each international um, migrant. Um, and migration is really concentrated. Six countries have 40 percent of all international migrants. The United States has one in five of all international migrants. And, but the share of migrants in the population varies a lot. The Gulf oil exporting countries, like Qatar, are mostly migrants, whereas the population giants, like China, Indonesia, have very, very few migrants. So just as migration into countries is concentrated, so is emigration out of countries. Uh, Mexico is the number one emigration country. Russia is both a sender and receiver of migrants. 
India has a lot of migrants, Philippines has a lot of migrants. Migration rates, that is the share of people born in a country who've left, are highest often for island countries, relatively small countries or countries that have been through war where you can have a third or more of the people who've left. Now, why migration? Just very quickly, demographic inequalities, economic inequalities, and bridges between sending and receiving countries. It's also important to emphasize that there's a simple fact that the number of nation states and therefore the number of international borders to cross has increased. In the 20th century, we roughly went from a little under 50 generally recognized nation states to about 200. And so if we have more countries, we have more international borders uh, to cross. As you know, today almost all population growth is in the so-called developing countries. And what that means is that the richer countries, which remember have 60% of the world's migrants, they're going to grow slowly and age. A country like Germany is going to have a population pyramid with a lot more older people uh, in, by 2050, whereas uh, a country like Uganda is still going to have a more typical uh, population pyramid with many uh, young people. And this demographic inequality sets the stage for a lot of migration. Just a little thought experiment. Remember back in 1800, there were about two Europeans for each African. So 20% of the world's people were Europeans. By 2000, the population of Europe and Africa was similar. They each had around 800 million people. But Europe is shrinking and Africa is growing. So that by 2050, we expect there to be about three Africans for every European. Now, when Europe was the most densely populated country in 1800, what happened? There was relatively big outmigration. About a third of the 1800 European population left in 1800s and 1900s. Uh, and so demographic inequality could set the stage for a lot of migration. But remember, migration has been and remains the exception, not the rule both because most people don't want to move and because governments try to restrict movement. But when we look ahead, you can picture cities in many developing countries growing, and you can picture uh, cities in uh, the northern or the richer parts of the world that, have, uh, that could be shrinking rather than growing. The economic inequality is very similar. The average per capita income in the richer countries is about $40,000 per person per year. The average in the poorer countries, despite the rapid growth in China and elsewhere, is a, is a little less than $4,000. And you can think that a lot of young people are willing to migrate to earn 10%, uh, 10 times more. And it's not just young people in fast-growing developing countries. It's also the idea that there will be a big migration out of agriculture in the next several decades. Agriculture today is still the number one employer in the world. And if you only know one thing about a country and you want to know how rich it is, just ask what share of the people are in agriculture. In all countries where less than 5% of the people are employed in agriculture, the country is rich. And in all countries, where more than 50% of the people are employed in agriculture, the country is poor. There's no exceptions to this 5%, 50% rule. And low farm incomes encourage especially young people uh, to leave agriculture. We know that in general, the richer countries are in the north. And we know that incomes in agriculture are typically lower than incomes in cities uh, in the south. Remember, there are. Uh, there are almost four internal migrants for each international migrants, but we have these inequalities that say people should move for opportunity, but we still need to link people in poor areas to people to places in richer areas in order to have international migration. And the three revolutions that make this linkage or this bridge over borders uh, uh, possible 
it, our first our communications, transportation, and rights. Think of communications. Back in the 1840s, when Europeans were migrating to the United, what became what was then the United States and Canada, they sent um, so-called American letters back to Europe, outlining the opportunities. Now, remember, you needed to be literate to write the letter. It took four to six weeks to get to Europe. You had to find somebody to read it and then respond. Today, with internet and cell phones, you can learn about jobs that are available in destination countries very, very quickly. In fact, some people say that sometimes migrant networks talk about jobs available quicker than local people learn about them. Transportation is the second thing. It's much cheaper and easier to travel now than it ever was before. Remember back in the, in the 1700s, most migrants could not pay the one-way transport to come from, say, the United Kingdom to, the United, to what became the U.S. Many people indentured themselves, meaning they promised to work four or five years to whoever met the ship's captain and paid the captain. So communications makes it easier to learn about opportunities. Transportation is far cheaper than it used to be. And then we come to rights. The rights of individuals vis-a-vis -vis governments have expanded a lot, especially after World War II. And generally, we don't make distinctions between, we did not make distinctions between migrants and natives or citizens in many of the constitutions that were developed after the war and in new nations in both Africa and Asia. And what happens then is that we say all people in a country should have certain rights, but when there's a migration crisis, as with the asylum, uh, the flood of asylum seekers to Europe in the early 90s, what do policymakers do? They can't do much about those demographic and inequality and economic inequalities in the short term. They really don't want to roll back the transportation and the um, communications revolutions. So what they do is they change the rights of migrants as in an effort to manage migration. Europe did it with asylum. The United States, remember, did it with federal welfare reform in the mid-90s. Almost half of the savings were to come from restricting the access of migrants to welfare, even though migrants at the time were about 11% of U.S. residents. Now let's talk about a few of the regions before we do questions. Immigration to the U.S., legal migration to the U.S., occurred in four waves. The first wave was before 1820, when we started recording it. The second was between the 1840s and 1860s. The third was the big one with Ellis Island and people arriving from southern and eastern Europe. And the fourth wave started in the mid-1960s when the U.S. changed its migration policies and favored family unification as the basis for coming into the U.S. And there was a big surge in the early 90s after a legalization program. Foreigners coming to the U.S. come through th roughly three doors. Legal Im immigrants enter through the so-called front door, and most of them, two-thirds of them, arrive because they have family members in the U.S. The side door is for temporary visitors, uh, everyone from tourists to business visitors to guest workers. And the back door is so-called uh, unauthorized, irregular, illegal, undocumented foreigners, who are, most of whom are caught just inside the U.S. borders. The big issue in the United States over the past decade has, or two has been what to do about unauthorized foreigners because their number increased very rapidly, uh, especially in the 1990s and again up until 2007, 2008. After the recession, the number stabilized, but it may be starting to increase again with recovery. Remember that international migrants or foreign-born people are concentrated among the highly skilled and among the low skilled. So years of schooling is the best single predictor of income. And the native born and the foreign born in the United States have a different distribution. The native born have a diamond shape, a wide bulge in the middle for US born people who completed secondary school but not college. Whereas migrants tend to either be college educated or more, or not have finished high school. So the averages can be similar, but they refer to very different uh, individuals. 
just a brief comparison. Remember, lots of Indian and Chinese and other foreign-born residents in Silicon Valley. And at the same time, lots of Mexican-born workers employed in agriculture and services. Keep in mind that the average Mexican-born person in the U.S. has less schooling than the average Mexican-born person in Mexico, as the, people, the Mexicans coming to the U.S. tend to come from rural areas where schooling levels are lower. Just a few words about other countries. Canada is different because it uses a point system to select migrants. Remember, most immigrants to the U.S. come because they have family members here. In Canada, the, the most come because one member of the family scored sufficient points. Europe is the continent of migration. It only has about 10% of the world's people, but it has a fourth of the world's countries and a third of the world's migrants. So what does that mean? If you have a lot of small countries, there are a lot of national borders, and with the European Union, having as a principle freedom of movement that is allowing and encouraging people to move, there's a lot of international migration in Europe. Remember, in Europe, Switzerland has the highest share of foreign-born, not foreigners, but foreign-born residents. But in most European countries, the share of foreign-born residents is very similar to the share in the United States, which is 13%. Asia is the, is the dynamic area that could be changing. 60% of the world's people, also about a fourth of the world's countries, but only about 30% of the world's migrants. And the Asian countries for, that take migrants form a triangle. Japan and Korea have very few low-skilled migrants. Singapore has a policy of welcome the skilled, rotate the low-skilled. The Gulf oil exporters rely on migrants to fill almost all um, uh, private sector jobs. Asia also has sending countries like the Philippines, most of which want to send more skilled workers to new destinations, that is, send people to Europe, higher wage, but most Asian migrants stay within in Asia. So that triangle shows that Japan and Korea have relatively few migrants, um, Thailand, Malaysia, those countries are in the middle, and those Gulf oil exporters have a lot. Africa about 15% of the world's people, also about a quarter of the world's countries, but only less than 10% of the world's migrants, with a big variation. Remember, people tend to move toward the south, uh, toward South Africa, for example, or toward the north. And there's a lot of plans in the various African regional groupings to have freedom of move movement. For example, and you can have, as in North Africa, you can be attracting migrants from sub-Saharan Africa, but still have many North Africans, many Tunisians or Moroccans, who want to move uh, to Europe. Latin America and the Caribbean are similar. Here we have relatively few of the world's migrants because most Latin American and Caribbean countries send people abroad rather than take people in. Mexico uh, is a country in which 10% of all people born have left. Almost all of them moved to the United States. In the Caribbean, there are very high immigration rates from countries like Jamaica. And, but there is also migration within Latin America. As you know, from Haiti to the Dominican Republic, Nicaraguans moved to Costa Rica. There's migration into to Argentina and more recently into Brazil. Unlike Africa, where most of the regional groupings of countries plan for European-style freedom of movement, the Freedom of movement plans in Latin America are not as well uh, developed. So to sum up, um, Europe is the continent of migration. Remember, 10% of the world's people, a third of the world's migrants. North America is really just two countries, Canada and the United States. So they have only 5% of the world's people, but a quarter of the world's migrants because they consider themselves nations of immigrants. That is, they take people from many countries and form a new people. Asia is the dynamic part of the world. It's got the 60% of the world's people, 30% of the world's migrants, and it really does have the extremes in both sending and receiving countries. Africa has the fast-growing population, migration to both the north and the south, lots of plans for freedom of movement. Latin America and Caribbean has been mostly uh, emigration, but some of that could be changing. So in thinking about how to manage 
the challenge of managing international migration. Remember, it's the inequalities that motivate migration and the revolutions that enable migrants to learn about opportunities and to move. The policy option that most people want is they want to promote economic development in what are now migrant sending countries to reduce those inequalities so that people migrate by choice, not necessity. But when there's a short run crisis, policymakers usually react by adjusting the migrants, uh, the rights of migrants in order to manage migration. The challenge is how to make sure we're on a path to what is called stay-at-home development and how to make sure that migrant rights are protected in that transition. And of course, the best protection is always the power of an individual to say no to a bad deal, to say, I've got an opportunity here. I don't have to. I don't feel like I have to go somewhere else. That is the challenge of development. It's also the challenge of managing migration. Let me stop here and look forward to your questions, and I will run back to the beginning, and you will see the screen at the beginning, um, which is the, the, the cover page of the monograph, uh, which I hope you find interesting and useful to think about international migration. So now I'm ready for the questions. Thanks, Phil. Um, so we'll start taking questions now, and use the questions pane in your GoToWebinar control panel and type in your question, click send. Phil, I think we have some questions coming your way right now, if you see them. Okay. Um, yes, I guess I have to click on these to... Um... Okay, so do we have any recent information on the net economic impact of immigration on the U.S. economy? Um, look, there are lots and lots of studies of the economic impacts of immigrants in the U.S. And, and in the U.K. and in many, many other countries. The hard thing is that migrants are about one out of six, or foreign-born workers are about one out of six U.S. workers. And they're very concentrated. And it's very, very hard to take a snapshot and analyze the impact of migration in a particular economic sector. And it's very difficult to do that over time. So when we, the normal thing that we're looking at in economic impact studies is how do, does the presence of foreign-born workers affect the wages of U.S. workers? And those studies tend to find relatively few effects. But then there's a National Academy of Sciences study ongoing now saying, well, how do we think about this over time? Uh, how do we think about, say, the public finances, the, the taxes that people pay in, and the benefits they use? That's a much, much harder question to answer. And it requires all kinds of assumptions. Uh, for example, for those of you who might know about this, in 1997, the, uh, there was a big study done in the wake of Proposition um, 187 in California, and it came to the conclusion that immigrants have a slightly positive effect on U.S. public finances. But the assumptions they had to make were that the children and grandchildren of immigrants would have exactly the same incomes and taxes paid and benefits used as U.S. born, and that the federal government would balance the budget and cut Social Security benefits. And of course, what that means is that newcomers who pay in more and get back less will be economically beneficial. So it's a good, it's a very good question to say, what is the economic impact? And the hard thing is both snapshots and motion pictures are really hard to develop in a way that convinces everybody. Many of these are done by groups that have a particular interest um, in having the migration doors either further opened or further closed. We got another question, which is, besides the UN definition, what's the best definition of an international migrant in the US? Um, so the United Nations, remember, has to come up with a definition which is useful around the world. And it uses the 12 months outside your country of birth uh, as a way to deal with 
the very many migration situations that occur around the world. Remember, using the UN definition, at least 12 months outside the, your country of birth, usually that means that migrants cross borders. Usually the individual moves. But of course, sometimes you can become an international migrant without moving. I mean, think of the Russians in Estonia after the breakup of the USSR. They became foreigners without ever moving. And the same happened with the partition of uh, India into Pakistan and India uh, at the breakup. So in the United States, we normally talk about foreign-born U.S. residents. So that's clear. They were born outside the United States. Foreign-born U.S. residents are about 13 percent of all U.S. residents, but they include people who have been here a long time, like Henry Kissinger or Arnold Schwarzenegger, as well as people who came just 12 and a half months ago. So in the United States, we typically use foreign-born, and then we distinguish within the foreign-born three groups, those who become naturalized U.S. citizens, those who are legal immigrants or legal guest workers or legal students, and those who are unauthorized, illegal, irregular. So an immigrant we normally think of as somebody who has uh, a, 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 the right to live and work almost anywhere in the United States and usually after five years to become a naturalized U.S. citizen. We've got another question, which is on definitions. And uh, the question is, is a person is a migrant if he left the country where he's born for more than 12 months? Um, a migrant in the UN definition is always a migrant. It, just like in the United States, even though some people came to the US when they were very young, um, they are always foreign born. So the person may have come to the US when they were one year old and they're now uh, 80 years old, but even though they've been in the US 79 years, they're still considered foreign born. So migrant is a label that you generally keep for life. Uh, it is true there are people who, for example, migrated from Italy to the United States in 1900 stayed a few years and went back. So once they were back in Italy, they were no longer migrants in the United States. And I don't know if the Italian census would have captured the fact that they were out of the country uh, for a few years. We've got some more questions here. And um, the question is, what would we suggest for African governments per, to promote what you term stay at home development. Well, this is the big trick that all countries are trying to uh, deal with. What countries are, you know, we know that there are successful examples of rapid economic development that mean a country sends workers abroad in one period and takes migrants back or uh, in, uh, admits migrants in the next period. Think of Italians who migrated to Germany and Switzerland and Northern Europe in the 1950s and 1960s. And yet in the 1980s, Italy had gotten so much richer that it was taking migrants in from other countries. It, the same was true in Korea. In the late 1970s, Koreans went to the Gulf countries to work on construction and other projects. Uh, and yet in the late 1980s, and especially in the 1990s, Korea started to admit migrant workers uh, in order to fill jobs. So what policy options? Usually the same policy options that make a country grow richer, often having the correct economic fundamentals, are the same ones that will promote stay-at-home development. In other words, there are many, many countries which try to do something special for migrants, but in many cases, the, 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 the better policy would be do something better to promote economic development for all people. Let me give you an example. 
I had a student who worked on how there was a special policy, I think, in Pakistan to help s returning migrants open small businesses. Well, the answer was not to have a special policy for returning migrants to open small businesses. The answer was to have a policy to help everybody to open a small business, because at that time, opening a small business legally in a country, in that particular country, was very difficult. So it's not so much that one needs special policies necessarily for migrants. The question is, do we have policies that promote stay-at-home development, or promote development for everyone, including migrants who may not then go abroad or if they return, uh, create jobs for themselves and other people. Uh, so the next question deals with youth out migration. Uh, being a driver of development. So a lot of studies now say that if a country sends workers abroad in one period, it will get back remittances, it will get back workers who, are, who acquired new skills abroad, and those workers then can accelerate development at home. So this is this idea that Countries that are today sending people abroad can benefit from that migration, that migration opens a window of opportunity to accelerate development, and that we'll have many more examples of the Italys and the Koreas or the Spains uh, moving forward over the next several decades. It's, it's, it's a very tantalizing prospect. Remember, remittances, that is money sent by residents of a country who are abroad, first surpassed official foreign development aid uh, about 20 years ago. And today, remittances to developing countries are about four times more than official development aid. So remittances are a new source of money controlled by people who typically want to get ahead. The question that we have to ask is, does sending workers abroad now make it easier to send more workers abroad in the future? Or does the process of sending workers abroad, getting the money back, and uh, having the people return, does that mean there will be less immigration pressure? As, as Charles mentioned in his question, I mean, Countries like the Philippines, one can argue whether the Filipino experience of sending workers abroad is laying the foundation for stay-at-home development or whether it's laying the foundation to send more workers abroad in the future. Clearly, there are countries, and as was mentioned in the question, like Eritrea, where it seems a lot of youth still want to leave and will take big risks uh, to try to go. Uh, there are some more questions here, uh, and you know, the question is, what should we think about European countries where populations are generally projected um, to shrink? And the question is, what will, you know, should European countries, will European countries um, open their doors wider to immigrants, especially skilled immigrants? I think the, the policy in most European countries is to welcome the skilled. I think the policy of many countries in the world is really has three elements. One is welcome the skilled with perhaps some argument about exactly who is skilled. Rotate the low skilled, that is, bring in low skilled workers to fill low level jobs, but then often try to rotate them out of the country uh, uh, after a year or two years or three years, as is done, for example, in Singapore, and then minimize irregular undocumented migration. The difficulty with, there's a difficulty with all three of those that welcome, rotate, and minimize strategy. The welcome part is generally that countries get fewer of the skilled migrants than they want. The rotate part is that guest worker programs have a history, and the history is usually summarized as there's nothing more permanent than temporary workers. 
some people wind up staying longer. Remember, these are young people, they're flexible and they stay longer, and to minimize irregular migration or illegal migration is often uh, very, very difficult uh, with people coming in and out, uh, uh, and unless countries have very tight administrative systems, that's, that's much more, that's, that's much harder to do. So I think European nations have and are trying to open the door to skilled migrants. I think they're considering new versions of posted workers and migration partnership agreements and other things which in many cases wind up being 21st century guest worker type programs and whether or not that in the end will work, uh, only time uh, will tell. Uh, going on to the next one, do we have any numbers on statistics? The numbers of statistics are, are on, uh, on ref I'm sorry, do we have any numbers on refugees? The refugee numbers are in the monograph. Roughly, the United Nations um, uh, High Commissioner for Refugees says there's about 10 million formally recognized refugees. So that means most of the world's 230 million uh, international migrants are not refugees, although some of them are asylum seekers. That is, a refugee is someone who leaves his or her country goes to another country and is recognized as facing persecution on account of race, religion, uh, sex, and other factors at home. And those people are officially classified as refugees. In addition, there are those who leave their country and go to another country and apply for asylum. And there are quite a few asylum seekers uh, in countries, and those asylum seekers are not yet are, are not necessarily refugees. In some cases, their applications are accepted, and in some cases, uh, they are rejected. But the 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 people of concern to the UNHCR are typically put at about 16 million, and that makes you know in a in a work in a total migrant population of 232 million, that means about 7% of the world's international migrants are part of the refugee and asylum system. Um, the last question that I've got here is, what are the current efforts to encourage international migrants from developing countries to return home and support development initiatives? Well, there's lots and lots of diaspora initiatives. So diasporas are people who are out of their country, sometimes settled abroad, sometimes temporarily abroad. And uh, there are many, many efforts to organize those people for, to promote development at home. Uh, there are many, many, since the United States has about 44 million foreign-born uh, residents, there are many groups of foreign-born residents in the United States that have clubs or organizations that seek to help or to promote development back home. Look at the way the Filipinos in the United States uh, recently organized to send aid back to the Philippines after the super typhoon caused lots of destruction. And there are similar groups that link hometowns in Mexico to uh, people in, from Mexico in the United States. So there are many, many groups. But the, the, the general rule tends to be that people from a country go back when they perceive opportunities at home. So the number of Brazilians in the United States went down after Brazil started growing fast about 10 or 12 years ago. I mean, think about it. Costa Rica is the only Latin American country in which there are more Americans living there than there are Costa Ricans living in the United States. So the general rule is that you can have special programs, and there are many special programs um, to help uh, people from a particular country go back. Uh, but in general, when people from a country perceive opportunity at home, they will go back. I think we have time for one more question, and so I will 
this question reflects a lot many of the other questions. And the question is, is migration good or bad for developing countries? Well, it's like with many things in economics, the answer is it depends. Migration is good in the sense that it provides jobs for people who might otherwise be unemployed at home. It provides those remittances. And people who return may bring back new skills or motivations. So the three R's, as we call it, that link migration and development are recruitment, or who goes abroad, remittances, how much money comes back, and how is it used, and returns. Do people come back to return to work and generate new ideas, or do people come back to rest or retire and then go abroad again? So the good, the migration can speed up development if those three R's work in a way that creates jobs and entrepreneurial vigor, as happened to a certain extent in Italy and Spain and, and Korea, or of course those three R's can work in a way that simply promotes more migration over time. So if the people who go abroad are the best educated, uh, the, uh, so that their exit winds up reducing the availability of jobs, if those remittances decline over time, or if they're spent in ways that don't necessarily help development, let's say they, that bride prices rise or the price of land goes up as people compete with each other for more land, or, and then finally, the return can be simply to rest before going abroad again, or, the re or people can stay abroad. So the important thing about migration and development is that there's no law or rule that says more migration now means much more development later. It can mean that, and policymakers would like to develop systems to ensure that migration spurs development. But it can also be the case that migration now increases migration pressure in the future. With that, let me thank all of you for joining this webinar. I, I want to thank PRB for publishing the Global Challenge of Bating, Managing Migration. I hope those of you who participated in this webinar found this interesting. and. I hope you will find the, um, the summary of the challenge around the world interesting and useful. Thanks again for all the good questions, and thank you for participating. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, so that concludes today's webinar. You can go to our website at www.prb.org to read and download the Population Bulletin, as Phil mentioned. And you can also watch an interview with Phil and very soon explore an infographic on global migration. Thank you everyone for joining in.